Whoa, okay, that is pretty cool. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about what seems to be the most accurate, the most detailed, and actually one of the coolest maps I've seen in quite a while. The map of the nearby 10 parsec or about 32.6 light years away from planet Earth, showing us pretty much every single star, every brown dwarf, all of the white dwarfs, all of the planets, and of course some of the other major objects with extremely accurate distances to those objects as well. A map that was a part of this paper right here that was recently published by these European scientists. And because this map is actually interactive and you can even zoom in here and go into detail and check out pretty much most of the objects near us, I figured this is actually one of the coolest things I've seen in quite a while. And so let's talk a little bit more about this because this is actually a pretty cool creation and there are some objects in there that might be of interest to you as well. So first of all, when it comes to different types of maps, we obviously have a pretty decent map of the solar system and of course different types of maps showing us all of the major objects and their moons in the solar system. Although generally these are usually not to scale simply because you would not be able to see planets if these maps were to scale. On the other side of the spectrum we also have these really cool maps of the universe with one of the recent maps I've talked about that was essentially the most accurate map of the universe near us a representation of which you can see right here. But these are obviously not very detailed because we're still learning about the universe and there are still a lot of undiscovered areas in the universe. So we definitely still have a long way to go before we have a really accurate map of even our own galaxy. But when it comes to mapping nearby space, we've done a pretty good job of the nearby, I would say about 10 light years, generally showing us what all of this looks like if we were to sort of zoom out and to try to find different types of stars and obviously different types of planets around those stars. But since we are constantly discovering new objects, new brown dwarfs, new planets and so on in the nearby space, these maps are still not entirely complete and obviously will always have to be updated as well. Which is why the scientists behind this paper decided to create this interactive website that essentially is going to serve as a kind of a map that's going to be updated with time, very accurately showing us the nearby 10 parsec or 32.6 light years away from planet Earth, with 540 different objects marked at the relative location and the distance away from planet Earth. But obviously this is a two-dimensional map trying to represent three-dimensional space, so it's not super accurate, but it is accurate enough and useful enough for us humans and also serves as an excellent guide to basically sort of direct us towards some of the nearest interesting objects in outer space. And also obviously serves a very important educational purpose as well. Although, okay, I need to actually clarify something before I go on. Because this is a projection of three dimensions onto a 2D space, this might become confusing because, for example, right here, the nearest object to us, Proxima Centauri, seems to be a little bit farther away than some of the other objects. But that's because we're looking at this from the top. In other words, it doesn't show us the true distance. To find the true distance, we also have to take a look at this number in brackets, which kind of shows us the distance below or above the plane we're looking at. In other words, this is also about two units below this map, so it's actually a little bit farther than Proxima Centauri, which is in the same plane as the solar system. And so in that sense, it's still a little bit complicated to read this, but it is nevertheless a really good map showing us the nearby 33 light years away from planet Earth. And to create this map and to create such an accurate map, the scientists use the ESA's Gaia telescope that is extremely good at marking the location and the distance to every nearby object. And so in terms of distances and obviously position in the sky, this right now is an extremely accurate representation of nearby space. But one of the major differences between this map and some of the other maps in the past that often included similar objects is of course the presence of some of the other objects here as well. So first of all, a lot of brown dwarfs have been added and many of these have only been discovered in the last few years. And also as you can see, each of these objects also now has the number of planets around them, including the names of those planets if they exist. And so here you can easily see some of the nearest planets and also some of the nearest interesting brown dwarfs to us. On top of this, it visually shows us what types of stars there are and if those stars are binary, trinary, quadruple or even quintuple stars, meaning that there are five stars in the system. And surprisingly, there are quite a few of those as well. There are at least three different quadruple stars 
and at least two star systems that have five stars in them. But I'm not going to spoil it for you or try to find it for you. Try to figure this out by yourself because it's actually kind of fun trying to explore this and to see something that you might have never known before. There are also 19 different triple star systems and a surprisingly high number of binary stars as well, 69 to be more precise. This also serves as an extremely important sample for statistical purposes, because using this we can now try to estimate the total number of things in the galaxy and maybe even then try to estimate the total number of planets and stars in other galaxies as well. And so, for example, out of 540 objects in this map, 89 are brown dwarfs, 249 objects are red dwarfs, such as the nearest star to us, Proxima Centauri, 21 are white dwarfs, which is essentially what our sun is going to become in approximately 5 billion years, and 18 of them are stars very similar to our own sun, G-type stars. And so this does kind of help us understand the general distribution of different types of objects in a volume of space in the Milky Way galaxy, or at least in our part of the Milky Way galaxy. But it can obviously be used to extrapolate the presence of these objects in other parts of the galaxy as well. But in this paper, scientists do mention that we're probably going to be discovering a lot more brown dwarfs in the next few years, mostly because they're kind of difficult to see. We also might find some other faint objects, such as rogue planets, and definitely find a lot of exoplanets as well. Currently, there are 77 on this list, but chances are that each of these star systems will have at least 5 to maybe even 10, kind of similar to what the solar system has as well. And so definitely a really cool sample and a really cool map. And if you get to look at this yourself, and also if you get to explore this in your free time, you might discover some really cool objects that you've never known about before. So, for example, in one of the previous videos, I've already mentioned these uh, so-called local clouds. There's a G-cloud right here, and there's also something known as the local interstellar cloud. And that relates to something that we've discovered not so long ago, which is sort of a, a, an assumption that we're flying through some sort of an ancient supernova, and some sort of a molecular cloud left by an exploding star a long time ago. But we're currently sort of on the edge of one of these clouds, the local cloud, and we're moving this way and we'll most likely be entering G cloud, another cloud, in a few thousand or maybe tens of thousands of years. Now obviously we don't really know what effect this is going to have on planet Earth, and if any, but from what the scientists understand today, the solar system most likely stayed in this region for at least 40 to maybe even 150,000 years. And back in 2019, scientists studying the samples of ice in Antarctica discovered that this ice contained the iron, interstellar iron, that most likely came from this local region known as the local fluff or the local interstellar cloud. So in some sense, it definitely affects our planet to some extent because all of this stuff enters the atmosphere but we just don't really know what these effects are. And by the way, this cloud itself is pretty hot as well. It's close to about 7000 degrees Celsius or about 12,000 Fahrenheit. But because there is so little stuff in this cloud, it's actually not dense at all, it means that generally you would not actually detect any of this heat, which is most likely the reason why this cloud is still there and why it's able to maintain its shape. It's almost like the magnetic field is holding these particles close enough to one another, preventing it from falling apart, even though stars nearby will probably create a lot of solar wind that should technically break it apart. Or in other words, this is definitely a mysterious place that still has a lot to teach us and that we don't really know much about. And if you get to explore this map, you're going to discover that there are quite a lot of these clouds everywhere. And then you might also discover something that looks like this these two red circles, known as the Stromgren spheres, which when very energized, sort of look like this. These are essentially regions, circular regions or spherical regions, of highly ionized hydrogen gas. And usually they're ionized by an object, very active and very energetic object, right in the center. Typically this is an O or B type star, which is definitely the case for this object known as the Rosette Nebula, but it can also be created by other objects. In this case, this large one is created by the star known as Sirius B, which is right there. And that's of course a white dwarf. The smaller one that you see right here is created by another star, which happens to be also a white dwarf. And that's generally speaking because Sirius B is a pretty massive white dwarf with a lot of emissions coming from it in frequencies of light that are generally ionizing, including the ultraviolet light and the X-ray emissions that you see right here. And so the hydrogen that was already present here, most likely from some of these clouds I mentioned before, 
basically gets ionized and creates this um, somewhat visible formation around it. Although it wouldn't really be that easily visible and it does require specialized equipment to try to discover it. But for some of the more active objects, it's definitely visible as long as you have some sort of a telescope. And so generally speaking, the hotter and the more luminous the star is, the bigger the sphere is going to produce. Also surprisingly, the denser the region is, the more hydrogen gas there is, the smaller the sphere is produced. And so the difference between these two could be that this just has a lot more gas present and so it gets ionized and creates a much smaller sphere. Whereas here the gas could be just more diffuse. Although interestingly enough, it doesn't seem to reach as far away as the solar system, so we don't really know exactly what effects it might have if our planet was passing through these gas bubbles as well. But anyway, overall definitely a really really cool map, a lot of things to learn about and a lot of things to kind of think about when it comes to the rest of the galaxy as well. And because this map is most likely going to stay up to date and get new updates as we discover new things in the region near us, I'll probably make sure to follow this up once this map gets a major update and something else is discovered that is worth talking about. But until then, check out all of the links in the description below, subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, and maybe come back tomorrow to learn something else. Maybe support this channel on Patreon by buying the wonderful person t-shirt that I'm wearing right now, or by supporting the channel through the channel memberships. All of those help me quite a lot, and thank you to all of you who've supported me for years. But anyway, thank you for watching, stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.